We're going to be talking about uh, designing your landscape for defensible space. Can you hear me? See? Good. Okay. Um, and we're going to cover a couple of topics. We're going to talk about defensible, what is defensible space? Okay, and define that and look at the various areas of defensible space, what they mean and how you should be landscaping in them. We're going to talk about new design considerations. Um, you do landscape differently for defensible space than we're used to. And it's going, it means that we're going to have to have a little bit of a headset change in how we look at our landscape, what we consider to be a good looking landscape. Um, and we're going to talk about those considerations. And then lastly, we're going to talk about plant selection and plant placement. So the first thing we're going to talk about is that there is no such thing as a fireproof landscape. <coughs> There's no such thing as a fireproof anything. Um, even fire resistant plants, whatever those are, will burn. Um, especially if they're not well maintained. And Mary Lou is going to talk after I do about the importance of maintenance and how you do maintain your landscape. But you want to make sure that you're watering it, you're properly pruning it, and you're doing the upkeep necessary. Landscape, unfortunately, is different than interior design. You can't, I mean, in, you put a, a, a couch in your living room, you don't expect it to grow <laughs> and get bigger and have to be pruned. But you do in your landscape. So it's one of those things, uh, we can all consider it a, a way to keep ourselves fit. <laughs> so uh, what is defensible space? Um, we're talking about creating an area around the home that makes it less likely that your home will burn. We're trying to defend the home. We're not trying to defend the landscape, okay? We're allowing the landscape to burn in order to protect our home. So when we're designing the landscape and we're designing our homes, we need to consider what's going to make it less likely to burn hot and high. Okay, those are the two dangers that we have. Um, so we want to make sure that our houses are built in such a way that they're less flammable and there's a lot of information out there. Cal Fire has a wonderful website that talks about how to do your home hardening. When we look at a house that is more likely to burn, okay, this house obviously, this has got all the wrong things going for it. You know, it's got, it's made out of wood, it's got wood siding, it's built on the edge of the hill so that there's no, all these flames are gonna come up from the, you've got flammable material, tall flammable material, down the hill, the winds are pushing those flames up into the house. Okay, what you want to do is you want to create an environment where there's not as much flammable material out here and what there is is separated so that it can't build on itself. Okay, if you have a lot of dense vegetation like this, it creates a much hotter fire than each of these individual plants will. Okay? So you're reducing the amount of fuel that's surrounding your home. So what do we mean, how do we create defensible space? There, we're really looking at three zones that you're creating around your house. The first zone is considered the immediate zone or some people call it the ignition zone. It basically is, that's, that's your moat around your house, okay? You know, I mean, we used to have moats around the castle. This is your moat of safety around your house. You are creating a space in here where there is nothing that's able to burn. And then beyond that, you're creating the next space which, where you are landscaping so that the fuel load is low and the heat will not get as intense. And then as you move further out from your property, out to 100 feet around your house, 360 degrees, it's not just the backyard, 
it's the whole thing. You want to make sure that within that 100 foot zone, you have reduced the fuel load and you've created islands of, of um, vegetation. And we'll talk about that and how to do that in this talk. Okay? So essentially, you want to improve your home's chances of surviving a fire. You want to slow or stop the spread of the wildfire. You, it's going to come. I mean, we all know that this last year was not a unique experience. California has, an, has a history of burning. It used to burn much more than we're burning now. And so we will continue to live with this as part of our, I mean, just like people in Florida have to live with hurricanes, we're going to be living with fire. And so we have to learn to adapt to that. There, fire is certainly not going to adapt to us. So we want to make sure, and lastly, we want to make sure that we have an area that's safe for firefighters. They're not going to come and save our house unless they can be safe. I, I, I personally experienced that. We lived in Mill Valley at the time of the Oakland fires. And we lived in one of those typical cliff homes, you know, out in the, in the middle of one of the canyons, deep, can deep in the canyons. And our we and our neighbors were very concerned after the Oakland fire that what, are, what, what should we do? So we asked the fire chief, and he came up and talked to us, and we said, okay, so what, what should we do in case of a fire? And his answer was run. <laughs> Literally. Because he said, I, we can't get up here safely. We lived on a narrow, one-lane wide road. There were lots of trees overhanging the road. There was no way, other way out. It was a dead-end street. And he said it would be suicidal for us to come up here. So our best advice to you is, if there's a fire, get up over the hill into Corte Madeira. Literally. So, you know, it is our obligation to make sure that the space around our home is safe enough for the firefighters to actually get there. Okay, so, as Mimi said earlier, you start at the house and work out. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number of people who've said, you know, I know I have this juniper next to the house, but there are these oak trees out by the creek that I'm really worried about. Okay? No. The, you need to worry about the stuff right near your house. That's the most important area that you have. So, and you start with the house. I mean, the house is the largest fuel load you have on your property. Okay, so you start and you make sure that, there, that, that the chances of the fire getting into your house are less. Embers are likely to cause, are the most likely cause of a house to burn. I heard a statistic that said that more than 50% of the houses that burn all burn from the inside out, meaning embers get into the house ahead of the fire, and the house burns down, oftentimes leaving the landscaping absolutely fine. So home hardening is really, really important. Um, once you get, after you've gotten your home hardened, then you start working on the defensible space. You start working on what we call the zero to five foot area. That's five foot perimeter around your house, the five foot <coughs> moat that you're going to design and build. And in that area, you have no combustible materials. Nothing that is combustible. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you have to have a plant, you absolutely positively have to have a plant within that area. Now, re recognizing that oftentimes you are risking your home in order to have that plant next to your house, okay, but if you absolutely have to have it, make sure that it's no taller than two feet, okay, and that it is either an herbaceous perennial or a succulent. Now, why do I say herbaceous perennial succulent? The reason is, is that those plants contain more water and have less hard, woody materials in them and therefore will not burn as hot. They will burn, but they probably won't burn as hot. Okay? Lastly, we are using non-flammable mulch. 
Okay, now what is non-flammable mulch? It's rocks. <laughs> it's the only non-flammable mulch I know of is rocks. Um, gravel, which is little rocks. <laughs> DG, which is ground up rocks. And concrete, which is glued together rocks. <laughs> so those are your choices. Okay, you remove all trees and tree limbs within this area, zero to five feet of your house. That means that beautiful redwood tree that's hanging over your house means that beautiful oak limb that's draped over the deck. Those are all fire hazards. It's all, I mean, it, we are going to be making choices. And the choices we make may determine how much of our, how, how well our house survives the next fire. So we're going to, and then we're going to remove or replace flammable fencing material. How many of us have uh, non permeable siding on their house, or non flammable siding on their house? and have a beautiful wooden fence attached to the house. <laughs> right? Okay. We need to make sure that that fencing material that's adjacent or attached to the house is non-flammable because that's a perfect way for a fire to get close to the house. Okay. The next area, once we've ma made those hard decisions about the zero to five foot area. We're going to be talking about the next area out, which is the fire break zone. This is the area where we're trying to reduce the fuel load, slow the fire down, and make sure that it doesn't get high and hot. Okay? It's meant to keep, we are landscaping this area to attempt to keep fire away from the house. We know fire will be there. We know fire will probably encroach upon our lot and our landscape sometime in the not too distant future, within the next 50 years. The likelihood is that we will have a fire near our home. So how do we, so we're trying to make sure that that fire doesn't get close to the structure. So we're going to plant <coughs> in islands surrounded by hardscape so that we have small areas of flammable materials and not one huge expanse of flammable. I mean, most of us have been used to landscaping so that you start at the house and you work out, right? But you got lots of plants that go forever and a few pathways that may meander through them. But basically, it's a lot of very dense vegetation. And what that means is, is that the fire will start at one end and just work its way all the way down till it gets to the house and goes, wow, yum, this is a big one. And then it'll eat our house, <laughs> right? So we want to keep that from happening. And we're going to do it by creating land, little islands of planted material that are surrounded by hardscape so that if this place burns, the likelihood is if the fire can't jump to this place and then jump to my house. Then we're going to talk about, we, in this area, we also want to talk not just horizontally, but we're talking vertically. Because fire travels in all sorts of directions. And we want to keep the fire, if the fire is coming down through that area, we want to make sure to do all we can to keep it from getting up into the tree and creating basically a torch that's going to shed a lot of embers and possibly create a firestorm that's going to attack our house. So we prune up all the limbs of our trees 10 feet or three times the distance between the shrub below it and, or three times the height of the shrub below it. It's a good incentive not to put shrubs below your trees. <laughs> because if you can imagine, if you have a four foot shrub underneath your tree, that means you have to prune the tree up so that the lowest limb is 12 feet away from the top of the shrub. That means it's 16 feet off the ground. That's a difficult tree for the grandkids to plant, <laughs> unless you create a ladder. But, you know, and it also aesthetically is kind of odd looking, especially if it's a 20 foot tall tree. <laughs> so, um, and you, 
so then, therefore, you want to obviously try to avoid planting shrubs or tall grasses underneath your trees. Um, and lastly, you're going to want to use plants with a higher moisture content because that will help slow down the fire. Trees with higher moisture content will burn less quickly and less hot. Okay, then lastly, we're going to talk about the reduced fuel zone, which is the, the zone that's 30 to 100 feet from your house. So we've talked about 0 to 5, we've talked about 30 to uh, zero, uh, 5 to 30, now we're going to talk about 30 to 100. It's not significantly different than the, 30, the 5 to 30 zone, only you just are going, because this is let, not as close to the house, you tend to allow this area to be a little bit wilder. But that means it needs more maintenance. So it, again, this area is meant to slow the fire down and to slow the, keep the intensity of the fire down. Okay? Um, we're doing the same thing of creating horizontal and vertical spacing of at least 10 feet between plants or plant islands. Okay? So you ha what we're talking about is creating a, a, a planting area and then creating a 10-foot space that is either hardscaped or non, fairly non-flammable so that plant, the fire cannot get going and really churn away at our vegetation. Um, so we want to create 10 feet vertically and horizontally. We want to keep grasses and ground covers as low to the ground as possible. The lower we can keep the fire, the less intense it will be. Okay. Um, Plant, again, like I just mentioned, we want to plant in 10-foot spacings. And where necessary, I mean, I don't know, how many of you, the 100 feet goes into your neighbor or your neighbor's neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor's neighbors? Yeah, I know, I'm in the same situation. I mean, the house, ne my next door neighbor is 30 feet away. So I'm, I, her, her backyard <coughs> is my defensible space. Um, my neighbor across the street is my defensible space. Okay, so it's really important if you're living in a semi-urban area like we do that you talk with your neighbors, work, create a group within your neighborhood where you're talking with each other about creating co cooperative defensible space. I mean, we used to think that the WUI was where we really needed to worry about. Coffee Park is a perfect example of why we as semi-urban or suburban dwellers really need to take this to heart and realize that we need to work cooperatively to create this defensible space in our neighborhoods. Okay, so when we're talking about how fire works, fire ha likes to burn up, okay? I've never seen, I mean, fire doesn't, very rarely goes downhill. It often likes to work uphill. It likes to work up into trees. So we are going to try, well, everything we're going to be doing is talking about reducing the ability of flames to get up into our trees. Because we don't want to have to live without trees. My God, trees are, not only are they aesthetically pleasing to us, but they're necessary for keeping the earth cool and certainly keeping our gardens cool. So we want to be able to plant trees in our gardens, but we want to be able to do it safely. And the way to do that is to create, make sure that there's nothing underneath the tree that's going to bring the fire up into the tree. All right, so if you have to plant underneath your tree, can't live without having that plant under the tree, then make sure that you have allowed at least three times the height of the shrub in distance between the lowest limb of the tree and the top of the shrub. Now, as you can see from this picture, that often makes an odd looking tree. I mean, you know, I mean, this is, this is a relatively small shrub. Um, three times that distance up to the bottom limb of the tree means you've got a lot of trunk sitting there. Um, so it would tend to make us think about using ground covers instead of taller shrubs when we're planting underneath our trees, um, or even reconsidering the necessity of planting under trees at all, okay? 
We're, we want to reduce the possibility of having fire move up into the tree, so we really want to avoid putting plants under the tree at all. Okay? If you live on a slope, it becomes, the distances become even greater. Okay? Because of the fact that fire likes to move up, if you look at this, it makes sense when you look at it visually. Um, four feet of distance this way, just horizontally, when you're talking about going up the hill, that four feet, because you're talking about a distance that's both vertical and horizontal and the way flames like to move, you end up having to increase that distance to get the same safety <coughs> measure. So when you're talking about a moderate slope, which is 20 to 40 percent grade, that's, this is 100, so 40 percent is like, you know, almost half of it, okay? Um, when you're talking about that kind of a slope, then you have to increase the distance twofold. So instead of being twice the distance of the, twice the height of the shrub, you're now talking about four times the height of the shrub, okay? So if you've got a tree planted on a slope, that lowest branch now has to be 32 feet above the ground. On a 20-foot tree, that gets a little difficult. You know, I mean, you're talking about large different distances, and I, I know this can be very discouraging. I don't want you to be discouraged. I want, what's important is that we start thinking about how to do it differently. Not to do it the same and make changes. We're really looking at doing it differently, okay? When you're talking about an even a bigger slope, like a steep slope like I used to live on, you're, you're talking about having to go eight times the distance, okay? Just to be able to get the same level of safety. So it's really critical when we're looking at how we're spacing our plants out that we think about the distances not just horizontally but vertically as well, okay? We need to s plant our trees, um, not just plant our shrubs under the trees differently, but we need to plant the plant, put the plants themselves further apart. So on a flat slope, you may space your trees 10 feet apart, and that would be fairly safe. Now, that's not 10 feet apart from the trunk. That's the <laughs> branches. That's 10 feet of air between the two trees, okay? Um, and your shrubs, like we talked about. When you're going to a moderate slope, you're talking about the trees needing to be 20 feet apart because being on a slope, remember the fire likes to go up, you're on a slope, that puts the flame closer to the next tree, okay? So we want to space them 20 feet apart. On a, on a steeper slope, we need to space them 30 feet apart to have the same level of safety, okay? Now, this is our next question, right? <laughs> Won't it look horrible? <laughs> Well, don't you remember when we started converting from lawns and we all thought, oh my God, a drought tolerant front yard is going to look disgusting, <laughs> right? But we thought, now we think they look great, right? I mean, we just, we have, it's just as we came to admire those drought tolerant gardens, I hope. <clears throat> and we started to, our eye changes. We realized, we, we, I mean, it, in the Middle Ages, they used to think that fat people were beautiful. Now we think you have to be this big around to be beautiful, right? I mean, it, it's just our, our, it's the aesthetics change. Our eye becomes used to new things, and we will ha get used to a firewise garden. We have to. And when you start looking at some of the gardens and how it's, it's really just a different aesthetic. They are just as beautiful. They're just different. And we will get used to that being different. Um, but is it really necessary? that we do this? I mean, what is it that makes one house more likely to burn than the other? 
What makes this house more possibly flat? Why is this house more likely to go up than this one? Well, yeah, we got a lot of gravel here and a lot of gro low growing plants. I mean, if you, if you have a fire come through here, there's not a lot of food for it. Whereas here, if a fire attacks here, you've got this tree growing close to the house, you've got this monumental fake sort of juniper-y type thing. I mean, you've got a great big plant with lots of wood on it right next to the house. And it's right next to this eave here where you've got exposed eaves underneath here, you've got exposed eaves under here. This is an invitation to fire. And we now want to change and make sure that fire doesn't like our house anymore. So the only way we can do that is to make the vegetation less desirable. So we're now, we're gonna talk about how do you select plants and place them so that your fire, your landscape is more fire wise and less, there's less potential that it will lead to your house burning, okay? It, it, your landscape, if there's a fire, your landscape will burn. All plants burn. End of story. Okay? But what we're trying to do is make sure it doesn't take your house with it. Okay? So, what are the, what are, as Mimi said, we don't have a fire resistant plant list. There is no such thing as a fire resistant plant but there are plants that are less likely to burn or will burn less hot. And that's what we would recommend. We wanna look for plants with a high moisture content. Um, we wanna look at plants that create less litter and are not throwing off a lot of excess dead material. I mean, one of the issues with eucalyptus is not so much that it is volatile, but that it throws off so much litter that you have piles and piles of dead leaves all over the place. You want to make sure that it has a fairly open branching pattern. Um, a plant that's open will burn less, I mean, if you, and, and it will have less dead material in it because dead material tends to get thrown off with wind and rain and whatever else, it knocks the dead litter out of the tree or the plant. <laughs> If you have a plant that's very dense in material with a lot of small leaves that sort of protect the inside of the plant, there's no way that wind and rain can get in there and knock that litter to the ground. So you end up having a shrub with a lot of green stuff on the outside and a lot of dead stuff on the inside. Well, all it takes is one little flame or one little ember to get inside that plant and automatically you have a torch right next to your front door. Um, you want to, again, broad leafed rather than narrow thin leaves because the broader leaves will take longer to, to light up than all those little tiny small leaves. Um, Non-resinous, not a lot of volatile oil in the plant, okay? Um, conversely, we can look at plants that have, are more likely to burn, okay? Those plants would be low in moisture content, Okay, um, lots of dead material. I mean, it's basically the reverse of what we just talked about. Dense foliage and lots of fuel, um, narrow thin leaves, and containing lots of oil or resins or waxes because those are more volatile. All right, so when we're looking for plants, we want to try and choose those that are going to be less likely to burn. And the ones, and we want to make sure dead sure that the ones that are fairly close to the house are certainly less likely to burn. We don't want to put plants that are highly resinous or lots of dead material inside of them right next to the house or within 20, 30 feet of the house because that will create an environment where your house is in danger. So what is it that does make one house more likely to burn? Okay, it's a hard thing because, you know, I mean, fire is very fickle. Uh, I just spoke with a couple th uh, that live up in Fountain Grove and they, their house is wood siding and 
Every house around them burned and theirs didn't. The fire came within 10 feet of the house on two sides. Now, why didn't it burn? I don't know. They don't know. But we, the, the thing is, is that, yes, we may be one of the few lucky wins that win the lottery of the fire and our house doesn't burn even though it should. But why put ourselves in that situation? We want to make sure that we've given our house every opportunity not to burn. Yes. Now, this is a photograph of a house in my neighborhood. <laughs> now, these people don't, they, this is pretty much an invitation to a fire to just come and eat my house, right? <coughs> I mean, you've got a great big redwood tree that's probably within 10 feet of the house. And then this thing, I'm not quite sure what it is, but both of these houses are sitting here. If this thing went up, these two houses are gone. Um, this is Juniper down here. So it's, and, and even though it's right, not right up against the house, the problem is, is that if fire hits this plant, and it doesn't have to be Juniper, it can be any plant, but it hits this plant and look at the different the distance between this shrub and that tree. It's less than a foot. So the likelihood is that the fire comes, comes up here, goes up into the tree, and there goes the house. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is break that pattern so that it, we can't allow the, the um, we want to create a space like this so that we have this large gap between, this is a lot of vegetation, all right? The likelihood is, is that if a fire comes, all of this is gonna go on, it's gonna burn, okay? But hopefully, and I, I would recommend, if this were my, if I were recommending what to do, I would say, get rid of at least half of this, okay? But even with that, you've got this large area of hardscaping in here, which will hopefully keep this fire from jumping to there. All right, and that's what we're asking to us, everyone to look at is planning your landscape so that you've created these spaces. Um, you know, this is another house in my neighborhood. You know, now this house is great. It's got stucco siding and a tile roof, which is wonderful. And you think, okay, they're fine. But if you look at it, there's wood beams coming out of the eaves, okay? And there's plant material very close to the windows. And if any, all of this stuff starts burning around this house, the likelihood is, is that the house will not make it, even though it is stucco and got a tile roof. Because with those eaves coming out there, that's all flammable materials. And the, the windows are not going to last forever with with flammable materials right outside, the windows are likely to break. Once the windows break, the fire's inside of your house. So it's really important. This stuff is really, really important. And, um, you know, whereas I know that this type of landscape looks a lot different than we're used to, but this, this will give us a, a fighting chance against a fire. Because as you look at this, yeah, they have some materials that I probably would recommend you take out around right up here. But basically, even though there's all of this vegetation here, the house has, this is, this is a protected zone because there's not a lot of vegetation in here. And what there is is really low growing and, not, and it's not going to catch, it's not going to create enough heat for that house to catch on fire. Or hopefully. Okay? So... What do we mean by creating islands? We're talking about creating spaces of vegetation that are create, surrounded by non-vegetative materials. C dry creek beds, patios, walkways. Um, there's lots of creative ways to develop air, hardscape areas within our landscape. We're used to the idea that landscape has to be all plants. Um, I can't tell you the number of times when I was helping clients with their gardens, the number of times people were, I would say, well, do you want a space for yourself in the garden? <laughs> and it was like, uh, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. You know, we think of gardens as something to stand outside of and look at. And 
what, what we're also suggesting is that this, by doing, creating these hardscape areas within the garden, we can create places in the garden for us to actually go out and sit and enjoy it. You know, knock. So, you know, there's a way to think of this that's a much, we, we can think of it in a much more positive zone, area, way. Um, we can create the islands using, you know, as we said, dry creek beds, lots of patio spaces out in the garden. Um, and um, looking at different ways to creatively separate our um, plant material so that the fire can't jump from one to the other. So how do we design against fire? Okay, well, first thing is make sure that the fireman can find your house, okay? Numbers on the outside of the house are really important, and so many people do not include this. It's very hard. If you can't find the house, how are you going to be able to, to um, how are the firemen going to help you if they can't find your house? So put the number on the outside. You know those people who come around every year and say, well, paint your curbside? You know, have them do it. It's great. Um, make sure that there's a 20 foot of clearance. If you've got a long driveway, make sure there's 20 foot of clearance so they can get those trucks up there. If you've got a lot of trees hanging over your driveway and they can't get their fire trucks up there, they're going to go on to the next place. They're going to go to the places they can really take care of. Um, make sure that there, there's no wood fencing up against your house. Now in this, for example, they have, now I probably would say this is not too smart, but this is a, a non-flammable fence up against the house. Um, this, Fences will burn your house down. Wood fences will, will burn your house because they're a way to get in. Uh, you don't want to store wood right up against. You actually want to keep it at least 30 feet. Isn't it great? I saw this picture. I thought, oh my god. These people never got the message, did they? Um, yeah, I don't think the firemen are going to go to that house. Just a guess. But. Um, you want to keep any firewood or flammable, flammable material at least 30 feet away from the house. Um, there was, I, we went to a presentation on fire a couple of weeks ago, and they, they were talking about some people who had really cleared their whole air, area. They had a wood deck, okay, and they, and, but they cleared out and they made sure all the vegetation was cleared away and everything was great, but they left a broom under the deck. Okay, guess what caught fire? Embers caught the broom on fire, the broom caught the house on fire. I mean, it doesn't take a lot. It's really going to take, it takes vigilance on our part to make sure that we're keeping that zero to five foot space really, really non-flammable. Um, and that means if we've got stuff stored underneath the deck, all that's got, we've got to think about really what is going to make our house defensible, okay? Um, in hardscaping, we can use fire-resistant materials for arbors and trellises. Um, there's a lot of beautiful uh, materials that people are using. I know we're really used to using redwood all over the place. But um, there's a lot of great metal and um, hardy board. You can use hardy board instead of wood um, for making a lot of these um, uh, structures. Um, using non-flammable stone or gravel, um, please don't use concrete um, if you can avoid it for patios because we're really trying to make sure that as much of the rainfall as we can get gets into the aquifer. And uh, hardscaping, as Mimi mentioned, um, concrete is not very permeable. And um, we've reduced our permeable sa surfaces within uh, I know within Santa Rosa, we've reduced the permeable surfaces by 80%, um, which is a phenomenal number when you think about it. All that water is running, anything, anything that goes in the storm drains goes right into the creeks and down into the ocean, and it's gone. So it's really critical that we, uh, when we're thinking about redoing our landscapings, that we use permeable hardscape materials instead of concrete. Um, there are a lot of great materials available. Um, create fire breaks using paving, pools, dry creek beds, terracing, all, anything non-flammable will help 
this was, I, I thought this was a great concept of you know decorating your side yard. I thought that well that was really cool. Um, you know creating a, a, a dry creek bed look um, and then putting stepping stones down the middle so that you can use it as a pathway when you need to. Um, but in the winter time when we get the rains and nobody's going to be walking around in their garden anyway, um, we this can act as a as a way for water to to percolate down into the aquifer. Um, so there's a lot of creative ways we can use these materials. Um, and using decorative gravels or stone within that far five foot area. Now, I know that we're, I mean, it's pretty much uh, a religious tenant that we have to use foundation planting around our houses, right? Um, I think we all swore to it or something when we bought our houses, I don't know. But I, I think we're going to have to change that concept and, and really look at not planting along the foundation. <coughs> and oh my god, that means that the concrete foundation is showing. <laughs> I mean, it's like we went outdoors and walked outside with our underwear on. You know, I mean, we, we just have this feeling that the foundation can't show. I don't know why. You know, I don't know. I'm not sure, but there is that principle that we can't allow one square inch of foundation to show. So we've all covered it up with green stuff. Um, but foundation really isn't that ugly, you know? I mean, it, it doesn't look that bad. It's just concrete. I don't know why concrete's okay here, but it's not okay there. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. But at any rate, I think we have to just sort of change that, that concept a little bit and be willing to let a little bit of that foundation show. Um, so plant selection. Um, it's really important we choose a plant that fits in the space. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure whether the people here live in the tree or the house, um, but I would not want to have to try and figure out how to replace the roof on that house. Um, you know, I mean, I know this is a bit of an exaggeration, but we often do plant way too close to the house. Um, and we plant, we put in plants that, oh, I'll, I'll prune it to fit. Yeah, right. About five years into that, we all go, oh, God, forget that nonsense. I'm not going to do that anymore. But um, if you, when you're going to shop for plants, if you take nothing else with you, take your Western Gardens book with you. Okay? They, they, have, they have tested plants in our area. Um, and they are going, they, they can tell you how big they're going to get. And trust them. I know it's this little tiny thing in a one gallon pot. But you know, when your kids are born, they don't come out full size. <laughs> you know, so why would we think the plants are going to stay that size? Um, they're going to get big. And they're going to get as big as Western Garden says they are. And not all manzanita grow the same size. You can get a manzanita that gets two feet tall and three feet wide, or you can get a manzanita that gets 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. They're all manzanita, and, but bring your book with you, and when the guy at the store says, I don't know, I worked in hardware yesterday, <laughs> you can see, you can read and see, okay, this variety gets this big, okay? So, Plants located within five feet should be two feet taller or less, okay? And please, if you, at all possible, we need to get ourselves off that drug of planting within five feet of the house. It's really not necessary, and we need to pull ourselves off of that, okay? Select deciduous plants with open branching habits and choose broadleaf plants. Plants on the, uh, the list that we talked about as far as having uh, characteristics that we will learn to love, okay? You don't want to plant next to the structure, especially next to vents or windows or underexposed eaves. Um, you want to eliminate continuous vegetation. I mean, if you look at this, even these walls make a difference. This fire cannot get up to those plants. There's no way these plants will generate enough heat to get to that. All right, and that's far enough from that that it's probably not going to light it 
on fire. Okay. Uh, now, granted, these are all probabilities and maybes, but we are creating an environment that's less likely to burn. Okay. We want to avoid laddering. I mean, this is this is a perfect invitation for everything here to go right up in flames, because you've got vegetation here with plant another small tree growing up to the big tree, and it's all going to go up into flames. We want to make sure that we don't put any large trees or shrubs within five feet of any structure. Um, now, I wanted to mention there is an ordinance called M. Wilo. Lovely name, isn't it? Um, the Model Water Efficiency Landscape Ordinance basically applies to new construction. And it allows you a water budget for your plants. It allows you to put in water that a, a total number of plants whose water usage would equate to 55% of what a lawn would use. All right, and it is pretty much it's, it, this is the state law. Some, count, some cities and municipalities may he, have even more stringent requirements. But basically, you are pretty much required to use low water use plants in a large, amount, large percentage of your landscaping. Now, what is a low water use plant? Well, well, then we get to a new thing called loopholes. Another great name. Okay, water use classification of landscape species. I don't know who dreamed that one up. Anyway, it is a listing. A bunch of scientists got together and they tried to do the impossible, which is to determine how much water a plant will use in any location. Well, that's ridiculous because the amount of water a plant needs is dependent on the amount of sunlight and the amount of wind and there's a lot of soil and all sorts of things. But they did their best. And this is the closest we have to a really good source of information on which plants, how much, which plants are, should be classified as low water use plants. So they've developed a list and they will tell you in, in Sonoma County, we are zone one. Okay? So for every plant, they list the botanical name, the common name, and in our zone, whether it's a low water use, moderate use, high water use plant. And when you, use, when you have to get your permit and go through M. Wilo, they will use this as the Bible on whether your plants are low water use or not. So when you're shopping for plants, it's you can go online and find this information out. It's probably, I mean, the list goes on for days and days and days. But you, if you can, you can determine whether or not these plants will make, will, will be low water use based on the woo calls. And any designer will use woo calls when they're doing it. So now that I've completely confused everybody, um, this, as Mimi mentioned, the Sonoma Marin Water, Saving Water Partnership has developed these plans. Now, they're not perfect, but they are a great starting point. Um, they, and they are, they're out on the table in the back, and I really recommend that you take a look at them. Now, for people with large properties, yes, it's probably much smaller, but remember, we're talking about the area immediately around your house as being the most important. Okay, so these classific these these um, plans will help you develop the landscaping for those areas. So when you go into them, they have lots of ideas for spacing plants. They have um, they use hardscape um, in very critical areas. Uh, they l use low herbaceous plants around the foundations because God knows you have to have a plant next to the foundation. Um, they have choices of different kinds of designs, contemporary, cottage, native, so you can choose, select sort of what you want. You can mix and match if you want to. Um, and for example, when you look at the contemporary design, they will, look, they will give you an overall plan and you can see there's a lot of hardscape they, they've really done their homework and there's hardscape all around the residence. So you've got this, this moat of, of protection now. And these trees are placed further away from the house. So they're not, they're not going to, they're hopefully, 
more than 10 feet. Um, and as you can see from the plant selection, um, a lot of it's low. All of this stuff around the house here is all low and herbaceous. Um, the, the cottage garden is pretty much the same. If you look, this is a, a patio. They've got the raised vegetable beds. This is a water tank over here. They've got water collection all around it. They've got, some of them have rain gardens that are used as the um, hardscape areas. For example, I'm not sure which one is it. Um, this one here has a rain garden so that you've got um, right in here so that it be, that becomes part of your hardscape area. Okay, So um, I have to close up now, but I wanted to just say this is our responsibility as homeowners. There's nobody who's going to come in and do this for us. It's part of what we signed up for when we bought a house is keeping it, keeping it and keeping it safe. We have to start with the house and work out. We create the defensible space zones, both vertically and horizontally. And by all means, remember that everything will burn. Okay, And then much of your success depends on what Mary Lou is going to talk about next, which is maintenance, 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 maintenance. <laughs> Thank you.